Matthew chapter 6. We're going to talk about a prayer that Jesus taught the disciples to pray. We often call it the Lord's Prayer. I'll give you some little history to that. The book of Matthew records much, much of what Jesus said. But Matthew was persuading the Jewish people that Jesus, in spite of the fact that Jesus did not come to set up an earthly kingdom, he, he nonetheless was the true Messiah that I've been looking for. <coughs> Matthew did this by connecting Jesus to the Jewish tradition. For example, Matthew traced Jesus' genealogy back to Abraham, not Adam. Matthew shows that Jesus often quoted from the Old Testament. However, he also showed how the, uh, the faulty religious practices that Jewish leaders were involved in, and Jesus called them fools and vipers and blind leading the blind and so on. Matthew also shows how Jesus demonstrated the kingdom of God through miracles. Now, this uh, scripture in Matthew, we must know, was given while the nation of Israel was still under the law. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, most of it was still under the law until the resurrection. So, uh, we, we need to understand some of those things, and why a lot of people get mixed up is they don't understand this is before the law, or during the law, this is after the law, and we got to understand who he, Jesus is speaking to, who Paul is speaking to, the audience is necessary to know, and the time frame. How many knows the scriptures was not written to us? It's written for us, but in one case it's written to the church at Colossae, it's written to the Philippians, it's written to the Ephesians. You know, those letters were written to them, not to us, but we glean from it. The Bible says all scriptures given by inspiration of who? God. God. And for four <laughs> things. Help me out. What they are? Instruction, righteousness, correction. But there's two more. Huh? Uh, that'll work. <laughs> there's two more. Anyway, it's written for four things. Correction, uh, instruction, righteousness. Uh, it's, somebody find that in Timothy. I can might be find it fast. I don't know. It's in Timothy. I'm almost sure. Uh, yeah. There you go. Profitable for doctrine and reproof. In correction and instruction and righteousness. Okay, that's the full thing. So the scriptures is important for us today. They're they're uh, not written to us. But so many things are relevant to today. Would you say that would be a consensus here? Okay, absolutely. All right. So Jesus uses terms that the disciples could connect with under the law all at the same time while teaching the kingdom of God. And remember, uh, Peter, James, and John, they didn't live back in Moses' day. But some of those boys went to rabbinical school and, and they were taught and supposed to have memorized the first five books of the Bible. So those traditions are handed down generation after generation and after generation. So these upstart disciples knew the story of the wilderness wanderings. They knew all of that. So Jesus uses things that they could connect with at the same time teaching the kingdom of God. It's, uh, there's always a, uh, with everything God does, there's an overlapping. I'll give you a, a, a prime example that we can all identify with. What time of year is it right now? Winter. 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 But March the 21st, 22nd, I don't it changes now. It used to be the 22nd or uh, 21st. What's that? First day of spring? Sometimes it's still what? Winter. And when uh, summer gets here, sometimes it's still <coughs> springy. And when autumn gets here, sometimes it's still summer. So there's an overlapping. 
And it seems like there's that with everything God does. I'll give you another example. Uh, Martin Luther, he began to see some things that the Catholic Church didn't teach. So the Catholic Church had been teaching certain things for over a thousand years. He left the Catholic Church and wrote his 95 reasons why he's leaving. But still did a lot of things that the Catholics did. Well, 200 years later, the Wesley brothers come along and they start teaching, you know, Martin Luther teaching justification by faith. And the Wesley brothers start teaching sanctification. Well, that was different. So the Wesley brothers are now heretics. <coughs> Got it? But, but Martin Luther was a heretic to the Catholics. 150 years after the Wesley brothers came along, there was the upstart of the Pentecostal revival in the early 1900s. Now the Pentecostals are the heretics. <laughs> now who's persecuting the Pentecostals? Those Methodist boys. 47 years later, we have the Latter Rain movement that God has moved in, and the Pentecostals are now the persecutors, and the Latter Rain people are the heretics. 1960s, we got the Charismatic movement. The Latter Rain is now the persecutors, and the Charismatic are the persecuted. It just goes on and on and on and on. <clears throat> so, Jesus is He's teaching them how to pray. They're under the law, but also teaching the kingdom of God at the same time. We get in that same dilemma. Sometimes we see a new truth that suddenly, as God's opened up to us, but we're living under an old truth that isn't so bad, but trying to bring forth the new truth at the same time, sometimes that's difficult. It's a type of, you know, when the Methodists were preaching sanctification, justification by faith wasn't bad, it's wonderful. When the Pentecostals were teaching on the, the Holy Ghost, sanctification wasn't bad, but you moved on to something different, new. So, God is always doing that in the life of a believer. So, Jesus was introducing the disciples to a new way of life that was hard for them to accept. I'd like for Bill to go to Luke chapter 11 and uh, we'll read the first four verses there before we get to Matthew. Luke 11. This is kind of the short version of uh, the Lord's Prayer. So in verse 1, and it came to pass that as he was as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Who asked? Disciples, thank you. The disciples asked. One of them asked to teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so on earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us, or sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All right. Go to Matthew chapter 6 now. Matthew chapter 6. Okay. Now I want to start with verse 5 in Matthew chapter 6. It says, and when thou prayest, Jesus is talking here, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. What would be their reward? Praise of men. What? Praise of men. Praise of men. Perfect. All right. Great. Be thou when thou pray it, but thou when thou prayest enter into thy closet, and when thou shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which is in seek seeth in secret shall reward thee how? Openly. But when you pray, 
Use not vain repetition as the heathens do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Sometimes us Christians in 2020 can, can fall into that same trap. For instance, if somebody's sick, we think, well, call this, call this, call and, I, and I, it's, I'm not against it, but sometimes in our thinking, if we can just get enough people praying, God will hear somebody. He heard the first one. Now, I'm kind of learning something about energy. Dr. Yoder's taught me some, and I've just read some about it. It's great to get all these energies with you. Not working against you. But when people, it's more than energy, when you start believing too. When two or more are gathered together, he's in their midst. So, if we can just understand it's not the how many, again, I'm not against this, what I'm about to say, it sounds like I am. I just want to show you the opposite. If we can just get enough people on our prayer chain to pray for them, maybe God will hear somebody. He hears us all. we got to understand that God hears us all. So, now, verse 8. Be not therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things you have need of when? Before you ask. You know, when you ask, when you pray and ask God something, that wasn't the first time he knew about it. He knew about it before you asked. Okay? So all right, in verse 9. Carl, would you read verse 9? After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven. Alright, let's get the next one right here. Notice it says, after this man I pray ye. Now understand this is this is old school us. <laughs> but these these disciples were Jewish boys that had been taught the tradition of their forefathers, and our father is sacrilegious. Because back in their tradition, it was it was sacrilegious to mention the name of God. Jehovah didn't have any vowels in it. It was too sacred to even mention the name of Jehovah. And they got out there in the wilderness, and the and the, the people, the six million people, have been there said, "We don't want to hear him." When he speaks, the whole mountain's full of smoke. You just had him to talk to Moses. But Jesus comes along and says, You pray this. Our Father. They didn't even want to mention his name and bring it down to a father. You know, Jesus later said, before he went and sent it back into the Father, he said, I ascend to the Father and your Father. I send it to my father and your father. So he's teaching here to, to the understanding of relationship that they had were used to. So he says, Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. His name is holy. It's hallowed. It's sacred. It's, uh, it's all of what you believe. But he's your father. He's your father. Which was strictly prohibited in the Old Testament. Alright, first ten under. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Thy thy kingdom come, thy will be done where? Where? Let's all say together, where's our kingdom come? In earth. On this side say it too. Where? Earth. In earth, okay. As it is where? In heaven. In heaven. Thy kingdom, pray this, he said to the disciples. Pray this, guys. Thy kingdom come, even though he's preaching the kingdom, they don't understand it. Preach and tap when you pray. Understand when you talk to the Father, our king, the king, our kingdom come is in earth as it is where? Now listen, they probably even know what heaven's like. We don't. We sang songs about it. And I've said for a long time, most everything we know about heaven is a guesstimate. We'll say, uh, 
Oh, they're no longer, you know, they're no longer having any pain, and you, and they're not. I agree with all that. But he said, pray that thy kingdom come in earth, just like it's in heaven. If there's no no pain in heaven, there shouldn't be any here. He started disciples out like that. That's the first followers of Christ. He's starting them out like this. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where in earth? As in heaven. You know, later the scripture says in 1 John 4, 17, as he is. Anybody quote the rest of that? So are we where? In this earth. As he is. And that's pretty powerful. And I've had four surgeries, so I missed it. You know, I've had a bathroom this morning. I haven't, I haven't succeeded there. So I'm not, I'm not throwing rocks at anybody. I'm just telling you. I, I've had my share of, of listening. But First John four seventeen says, "As He is, so are we in this earth." I want to read that and say, "Huh," <laughs> but I know it's true. As he is, so are we more yet. Eleven. All right, Chris, you ready? Jesus is there, David. Oh, that's a easy one. I forget to done that one. Give us this day our daily bread. What do you think Jesus is alluding to? The wilderness, <coughs> when they had bread every morning, it appeared on the ground. <laughs> I was listening to Lynn Howell's teach on that. He said, Krispy Kreme donuts. This <laughs> was on the ground. And I laughed at that, but I was reading in the scriptures, and it pretty well looks like a donut. I went back and studied that. It is pretty close to it. Yeah. Come on in, Bob. <laughs> All right. So, he said, give us this day what? Our daily, our daily bread. So, he's, he's saying, you know, he's reminding them of what they had in the, in the uh, Old Testament, the manna on the ground. But Jesus said later, I am the bread of life. Church, this is Bob and Sarah Cumberland. Bob from my own land, fully integrating. <laughs> and I'm glad you're not driving today. <laughs> Amen. Give us this day our daily bread. And, uh, but, uh, can you get uh, John six forty eight, Bill? John six, that's big John six forty eight. In 48 verses says, I am the bread of life. And he says, your fathers did eat man in the wilderness, and they are what? Dead. Dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which cometh down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I'll give is my flesh, which I'll give for the life of the world. I was reading, uh, I'm not going to read any more of that. But reading the rest of the scripture, Jesus says, saying, you've got to partake of me if you're going to have life. And I got to thinking about that, and I thought, you know, he said, you've got to partake of me if you have life. And sometimes when we have communion, we just want members. We ought to go gather up all the prostitutes, pimps, Alcoholics, let's say, come have communion with you. Unless you do this, you don't really have life. Maybe they'll learn something about true communion is really communing with the Father and enjoying and partaking of what He's already done for us. Are we done verse 12 yet? Okay, we've got verse 12. Piper, I give it to her, and she don't have sheep to class. 
Go back to Matthew 6, Bill. And forgive us our debt. All right. Luke 11 says, says this, I just read it a while ago, says forgive us our sins as we forgive those who are indebted against us. So, you know, Jesus still under the law until the resurrection, he also said, let me back up, or let me preface it with this. How many believe when Jesus died on the cross, he died for everybody? He didn't leave anybody out. But he said this one time, if you don't forgive, your Father, which is in heaven, won't forgive you. Remember, that's still under the law, because under the law is an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, yada, 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 okay? So he's, he's really kind of reminding them how it was under the law, but another place Jesus said later, after the resurrection, he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, with all thy might. And he said, this is the first and great commandment. And the second commandment's like this. Thou shalt love the neighbor as thyself. And then he said, on, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. So, Jesus is not contradicting himself. One's under the law. One's after the resurrection. The resurrection did change things. Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often should I forgive? How about seven times? <laughs> he said, no, that won't work. Uh, I thought it was something interesting. Peter said, how often should I forgive my brother? I thought, if it's been an enemy, because Jesus said on the, the Sermon on the Mount, Bless them that despitefully use you and bless them that curse you. And, you know, and the church come around and said, but God will send them to hell. He's telling us to bless them. So we, we have a contradictory here. Jesus said, bless them that curse you and bless them that despitefully use you. And Peter goes and comes to Jesus and how, how often should I forgive? Seven times? No, he said, uh, how about 70, 7 times 70? That's your brother. That's 490 times if I know my math. You know, I don't think my brother could even do that much against me in one day. But it's not the numbers <laughs> considered. It's, it's just saying, just forgive. Just constantly forgive. How about verse 13? Is that there? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Alright. The message Bible says keep us safe from ourselves. You see, God does not tempt, does he? James 1, do you have James 1, Bill? James 1, 13, 14. It should be on your deal. No man, there we go, thank you. No man can say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. What's the last? Neither tempted he any man. Next verse. But every man is tempted when he's what? Drawn away with his own lust and enticed. I'm going to ask some very uh, some questions that may jar you a little bit. But Sometimes that's the only way we think. Why would God say deliver us from evil? I'll tell you why. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Here we see Jesus teaching his disciples to pray while still on the law. Did anything, my question is to you all, did anything change after the resurrection? And I want to ask you some questions here. Now, I'll give you an answer to them afterwards, but just think. Is it necessary to pray? Don't, don't answer me. Just think. Because I want to give you some hairy questions here. 
This, this one from Brother Mike, chapter 1 now. I'm not putting it on you. I ask myself, do I really have a devil problem when Jesus said all power is given to me in heaven and earth? He didn't say, I have half of it, and the devil has half. He didn't say, I got a little bit back after the death, burial, and resurrection. I got a little bit of that. I stole, got it back from the devil. Or he didn't say, I got two thirds of it, and the devil still got a third. Didn't say that either. He said, All power is given to me in heaven and earth. This is what I declare to myself. I don't have a devil problem. I have a problem believing God. Society, friends, maybe school teachers, college, lots of things have impinged itself on all of us that cause us to doubt. We start our children doubting. I did. I tell you, when those kids were little, I'd stand them up on the on the, the counter at the house or the and cabinet. I'd say, jump to that. Man, they just leave. I'd stand them back up there. I'd say, jump to daddy. They just leave. Guess what I did next? I stood back. <laughs> jump to daddy. And then they were hesitant. But they would jump and I would catch them. And I'd jump, step back a little more until they were afraid. I did not have any idea I was building and promoting doubt in my kids. Well, that's just a little simple. I probably did a lot of other ways that I figured out yet, Andy. But, but, you know, we start out teaching them to doubt. There's a whole lot more to your kids of do, don'ts and do's, right? <laughs> so, if Jesus said, and I'm just, I'm just making a suggestion to you, this is where I stand. If Jesus said, after the resurrection, all power is given me in heaven and earth. I just am cho choosing to believe that. I don't think I have a devil problem. That's just me. Now I see a lot of stuff out there that makes it wars against that thought process. I see a lot of things. I see a lot of things on the news that looks like the devil to me. I just can't contradict what Jesus said. Maybe it's what James says. We're drawn away by our own lusts and enticed. You know, if a, a bank robber don't get up some morning, I think I'll go over all the First National Bank. He's been thinking about it a long, long time. He might have started with candy in the grocery store. Right? And he might have started a little bigger thing. A little bigger thing. We have an FBI friend who's now passed on, but his, I don't know what the echelon he was in the FBI, but big. He said, and he was in California, he said there's a group out there that girls had to learn to do the, this was back in the 50s and 60s, had to learn to do the jitterbug holding a typewriter between their legs. Now that takes some practice, I promise you. <laughs> I'm just saying, Big things don't start like that. We're drawn away of our own lust and enticed. That's what I think it is more than a devil problem. Does that make sense to you? And if it don't, it's all right. We're still friends. What did Jesus mean when he said it's finished? These are questions I bring to my own mind. Is it necessary to pray? What did Jesus mean when he said it's finished? I think you meant, I've done all that's necessary for me to do. That's the way I, I get out of that. You know, John came along and he said, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Did he take it away or is it still a lot of sin out there? I'm just making this thing. He said, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the, he didn't say sins. He said the sin. So there's one sin that messes people up. The sin that he took away, I feel, what Adam brought was a broken relationship. And as long as people don't realize 
that Jesus forgave everybody on the cross and they feel like they're a nobody and they feel like they're lesser than anybody else and they feel like I'm a nobody and I'm a this and I'm a that. Listen, God didn't make any junk. All of you are important to God. I don't care if your parents said you was a slip up and you didn't aim, they didn't aim for you to be here. God did. God aimed for you to be here. You are God's child. And everybody else is God's child. They just society and religion has impinged on them to the point that they have no idea of that. If we could just say, tell them, God brought back relationship. He's our father now. Paul even brought it down to a different level. He said, you can call him Abba, means daddy. That was sure sacrilegious to the Jewish tradition. But Paul, or John said, behold, the Lamb of God which taken away the sin of the world. And my question to myself was, is there still sin in the world? Or did we not comprehend what, what Jesus did where sin is concerned? It's the relationship. See, I think sin is some guy on meth. That's what I grew up thinking. God's drunk. God's murdered somebody. And I'm not saying those things are right. But the sin that Adam brought is broken fellowship. Jesus restored that. We used to sing a song years ago. We might have sung here a time or two years ago. It goes something like this. I owed a debt. I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And Jesus did that on the cross. He did that before you even had a chance to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. He already forgave you before you asked. It's good that we ask. Amen. It's good that we be repentant. It's good that we have some remorse. But he still has to heal enough before we ask. <laughs> Isaiah 53, 6. Show you what a prophet said. 700 and maybe 50 years before Jesus came. He said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone in our own ways. And the Lord, as he prophesied. Think of Jesus. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of a few of us. He's laid on, us, on him the iniquity of all the prophets and pastors, let's say. No. He laid on him the iniquity of who? All. All of us. I've got an old, 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 old set of commentary. Sometimes I just get stuck. And so I'll go back to this old commentary and, and, and uh, kind of look for something that might unstick me. <laughs> but it, while I'm looking for something else, I come across this. This old commentary is written in the 1800s, and it says, we now can pray like this. Hallowed be the, the name of our God. His kingdom has come. His will is done. He hath forgiven sin. He hath delivered us from the evil one. His is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I like that. In closing, prayer is mentioned a lot of times in the scriptures, and it's mentioned in the New Testament. After the resurrection, it's mentioned several times in Acts. Corinthians talks about praying in, the, in tongues and praying in the spirit. Paul said to the church in Colossae that he did not cease to pray for them. But I won't be able to find James 5, 13 to 18, if you could. Uh, James 5. James 5. It says, Is there any sick among you afflicted? Let him do what? Pray. So, we're not going to leave prayer out. I, I mentioned a while ago, is prayer necessary? I find it in the New Testament after the resurrection, okay? Is there any, uh, in, any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any married? Let him. Is uh, Dave said a while ago, let him. 
same songs. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them do what? Pray over him, anointing him with oil. Verse 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he's committed sin, they shall be what? Forgiven him. This is confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. That's what we did this morning, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent, what? Prayer of a righteous man or lady availeth what? Much. Elias was a man subject to like passion, talking about the Old Testament, as we are. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. As I see it, prayer lifts us out of self. Out of selfish thoughts. Out of selfish feelings. Into a communion with God which is the life of our soul. How many of you know that uh, Sandra's sister Gloria passed the other day? Uh, I guess you brought me that, did you say? I love every one of y'all, and I, I, I think y'all are saints of God, but I'm telling you, Gloria was a saint. She might have been a strong Republican, but if she thought she offended a liberal Democrat, she'd probably cry for two days. That's Gloria. The old lady said, I, I got her groceries, she counted out the money, and Gloria's getting where she couldn't hardly get around very good, but she counted out the money like two pennies. The next day, she hobbles out the car, gets in her car, and drives across town to give her two pennies. So she's just, she's just ultra full of integrity. But I thought this would be, you brought it at a good time, this would be very appropriate. I'm going to read her prayer list. Now, every morning she spent two hours in prayer. This is what she covered. Now, a lot of you won't know a lot of these names, but I'm going to mention them anyway. Her prayer list started, number one, nation and leaders, President Trump and family, and Israel. She gives scriptures for that. Number two, her pastor, his wife, and family, and anointing. Missions and mission budget. Holy Ghost and fire for God, for God revival that cannot be quenched in Europe, Asia, Africa, all the islands of the world, Australia, Antarctica, North Pole, North, North Central, and South America. Then she's got here, watch and pray with the, the scripture where that's found. She mentions Lois and Dennis, Chris, Tiffany, Nathan, and Abigail, Tina, Andy, Jake, Sam, and Jaden, Darwin, Debbie, Anita, and families. Hipton, Cooley's, and Evan Lund. Linda Ives, Kay and Jim Bob McPherson, Lauren, Kathy, and their family, Tommy, Jill, Sam, Christy, Whitney, and their family, the Bobbits, Stacy, Stephen, Lynette, Arlene, and family, Frank Brooks. Frank Brooks was a little, was a little boy in our church, now pastor the church in that area. The Frank Brooks and family, Carla Weininger, victims of human trafficking. Nancy Wisdom and the Prison Ministry. Rhonda's sister, mother, and aunt. Rhonda and Christy Barnes and family. Reed and Dennis. Sarah and Boyd. Robert. Sister Smith. Jimmy, Sonny, Erica, and John. Rochelle, Tiffany, and Dustin. The Crump family. Yay. Sandra. Tara, AJ, Elizabeth. The Kenneth Copeland Ministry, William Cathedral, Joyce Myers, Franklin Graham Ministry, Benny Hinn Ministry, Willie Nicole and Family Ministry, Mary and her family, Sandy Ball, Brother and Sister Barton, Billy and Lisa Miller, Mike and Lisa Smith, Diane and her family, the Cobles, these are Anson, the Cobles, the Suttons, the Jockleys, the Wallaces, 
Matt and Lori Crouch, the Holocaust survivors, Doris Hedrick at church, and the Doris that I met at camp meeting. These are people that she prayed for every day. You know, sometimes when people say, I'll, I'll be praying for you, that means I'll think about you when I'm taking the kids to school. But Lord, pray. There's some people in this world, when you say, when you pray for them, it means when they get home, they'll kneel at their couch or their bed and they'll pray. It's almost a forgotten art for people to pray. Now, just think about it. to pray. Sometimes that can be intercession. She had the crow family. That me and my kids. She didn't even know what we go through or don't go through, but she prayed for us. And that's just the list she prayed for. Then, as the Holy Spirit brought up names, she prayed for them too. Uh, true prayer. There cannot be true prayer without a reverence to God's holiness. And I think really true prayer brings us to worship. The more we pray, it doesn't get God's attention more, but it, it brings a more of a reality in us that God's kingdom is really in us. Because the kingdom of God is really not an organization with a Headquarters, but the Bible says the kingdom of God is righteousness. Help me out. Peace. And what else? Joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. And I know there have been times, Foster, that I prayed, and sometimes the only way I could get a release is just praying in the Spirit. I didn't know what I was praying for when I prayed in tongues, but I know this much. The Bible says I'm praying a prayer of faith, and that's important. Years ago, when we lived in Salem, we lived and I adopted a, a kind of a little pact between us. And when somebody called us and said, pray, we would pray right then. And we might pray later, too. So we just joined hands and pray. And while I was praying, Dave, I listened to her. When I got through, I said, you know, God's in a quandary. Because <laughs> if he answers your prayer, he's not going to be answering mine. Because <laughs> we prayed opposite of each other. And so we got to decide we would just pray in tongues. We pray in the Spirit. God knew the deal. When we, we was, when we prayed first time, he found out about it. You know, he already knew. So we'd pray until we got a release in the Spirit. And I prayed a lot of times going down the road. You know, I've never told you, Bob, but your name is on my prayer list, painted on my mirror. Where I shave, where I wash my face, and it says, Father, I lift up Bob, Gary, and Michael to you. And I ask you, Lord, to give them a good year, good health, and I thank you, Lord, they're going to make wise decisions concerning our trucks. And they do. I trust them. But Bob said, I need new tires. I'm well, did you my ear? <laughs> no. I trust him. I know he knows. Right? He'll say, hey, we're going to need new tires about 10 more thousand miles. That prepares me. And I appreciate that. So we do call your name out. We don't leave you out, Sarah. Just keep making them good cookies. <laughs> I'll tell you that one can bake. Now let's tell you. <laughs> she brought us so much candy instead of Christmas. And Linda just went around looking at the boxes. She said, What we got her for Christmas was less than she spent on the boxes they said was coming. <laughs> oh my goodness. And his mom knows that Sarah could bake good. She said, Linda, she said, did that lady make you any more fudge? <laughs> <laughs> Linda said, yeah, I'm not making some. But prayer is so important to us. Some 
time people praise, I will be done, is a cop-out for prayer. Now, I think it's good. I'm going to say something about this. Sometimes people don't want to pray and just say, Lord, do whatever your will is. Well, my thing is, go to the will book. That's the Bible. See what his will said. And then pray that. Now, let me say this. He has two things he said in the scripture. A lot more, but I'm just going to bring out two things. In Isaiah 53, 5, he said, what? He might tell me, go in. He said, well, by the time of Jesus, we're healed. We were, we are healed. In 1 Peter 2, 24, it says, and when he strikes, we were healed. So, pray those things. Now, here's my take on doctors. If you go to the doctor for treatment, is not working against that. That helps your faith. Okay? If you need to go to the doctor for treatment, go. But don't throw these things out. Just keep saying, thank the Lord. Healing is working in me. We say healing is working in Kathy all the time. She took treatment. We need to let treatment. Oh, well, you just throwing that out. No, 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 no. God's the healer. They can remove something, but still God's the healer. So we just kept praying for Kat. Thank the Lord for healing. Thank God for healing. Thank God for healing. working in her. Amen. Father, we just thank you for a great listening audience today that took time to listen. Hopefully, Lord, we said something that stirred their heart and helped them to realize Prayer is necessary after the resurrection. It is important to pray. It is important to intercede for people. I thank you, Lord. Even though you taught the disciples something under the law, you showed them after the law how to work, how to pray, what to do. Thank you, Lord. I just appreciate your work what you did on the cross. It wasn't just for all. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just praise you and thank you, Father, for all that you've already done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do. And all those that are out today because of various situations, we lift them up to you. We lift them up to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God.